All right, it's going off now, OK? He did warn me he was going to do that um, before we got going. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to see um, so many of you here on such a beautiful afternoon. My name's Sarah Crown, and I'm Director of Literature at the Arts Council England, which I hope is not a disqualifying statement to make when we're in Wales. And this is Peter Dunn, um, and he is the author of this book, The 50 Things, Lessons for When You Feel Lost, Love, Dad which is um, quite a long subtitle. We might talk about that in a minute. Yes. Um, and the way in which um, we're going to organise things today is that um, Peter's going to start by reading um, a couple of the entries from the book. I'll ask him a lot of questions, <laughs> and I'll make sure that there's plenty of time at the end for everybody in the audience to have a chance to ask their questions as well, because if you've read the book, um, you, I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions of your own about it, but certainly um, a lot to discuss, I would suggest. And if you haven't, um, you'll be glad to know <laughs> that the book is on sale in the bookshop, and um, you can um, go and buy a copy and read it afterwards. So, Peter, if you're happy to start um, with a reading... Which one? Humour? Um, yeah, go on, humour me. <laughs> so, um, I'll have to find it. Here we go. So, OK. This is all true. Um, <laughs> Humour, which is the eighth of 50 things. I realise it's only a few pages since I wrote about laughter, and it's possibly a little early to be rehashing anything. In my defence, however, I think it's true that this one could just as easily be titled Bad Parenting as Humour. And unlike every other post so far, this one is also about a single, specific incident, an anecdote involving Charlie. So why use this story? There are two reasons. The first is that it perfectly demonstrates the gap which must exist in order for humour to be experienced. Humour is created when two opposing ideas are juxtaposed or contrasted, and the gap between them is forced shut, creating an emotional outburst that we generally experience as laughter, or humour. The great northern UK comedians such as Alan Bennett and the late Victoria Wood knew that a great gag can easily be generated when you juxtapose the profound with the absurd. There's a brilliant Victoria Wood sketch where she asks Julie Walters' character if her mother likes Spain. Well, she likes the majesty and grandeur of the landscape, comes the response, but she's not too keen on the bacon. <laughs> That's the gap. And whether you find it funny or not is about, whether you're, whether, is about only whether you relate to it. Make it culturally relevant to your audience and get the timing right, and you will bring the house down. But even if you have no desire to make others laugh, being able to recognize the gap will help you to appreciate many truly great moments in everyday life. Why is it important to be able to recognize the comedy of, of life? Try hanging out with someone who has no sense of humor for 20 minutes, as that will demonstrate the answer better than I can, anything I can write here. I've given this a lot of thought over the years, and I think humor is the most effective form of stress management going. Every time you laugh, you release a burst of energy that dissipates into the atmosphere as joy, leaving you feeling lighter, happier, and less stressed. And stress is a big part of modern life. Everyone has stress of some kind to contend with in their lives. It happens to all of us. Anyone who commutes to work in a big city knows about stress, as does anyone who has ever had to deal with unsolicited sales calls at home. But turning the humdrum, everyday stresses of life into humor is a way to overcome them and to avoid losing ourselves in them. It elevates our daily round and gives us a commonality with our fellow man. It makes the boring bits of life that bit more bearable. Life can be tough, and sometimes we get worn down and forget about important things, like being happy. That's where humor can help. And if you pay attention, you'll realize that everyday life can be an absolute pantomime. The second reason for learning to recognize the... Not the first time in my life I've been upstaged by children, <laughs> as you're about to hear. The second reason for learning to recognize the comedy of life is that you'll be able to store up a harvest of wonderful memories for your old age. Every word of what follows is true, and it will keep me chuckling warmly on many a long winter's night into my dotage. The summer of 2007 was spectacularly wet in the UK. I had gone to pick up Charlie, then aged 10, from a sleepover, and en route home, I had picked up a friend of Esme's who would have been about six at the time. For the purposes of this story and to avoid, to mitigate the risk of litigation, we'll call the friend Jane. <laughs> Lamenting the incredibly wet summer we were having, I asked Jane if she had been away on holiday. Oh yes, she replied enthusiastically. We went to stay with a friend of Daddy's in France. Well, how lovely, I replied. Whereabouts? A place called Condom, she said innocently. <laughs> 
Beside me in the front seat, the 10-year-old boy sat up attentively, like a Jack Russell, which thinks it may just have seen a rabbit in the undergrowth. <laughs> Not sure if there's anything there, but definitely worth further inspection. <laughs> Leave it alone, I muttered threateningly. It's a place in France. <laughs> Step away from the innuendo. <laughs> Charlie shrugged diffidently and sank back in his seat. I sighed inwardly and decided to change the subject. Do you like reading, Jane? Esme is loving her books. Oh, yes, she enthused. I really love Paddington, but Mummy just gave me a new book about some children called The Famous Five, and I'm really enjoying it. Too late, I watched in dismay as the Jack Russell shot after the rabbit. <laughs> oh, I loved The Famous Five too, Jane, Charlie smiled wickedly. Now remind me, what were they called? Julian and George, and the dog was called Timmy. Who were the others? Dick and Aunt Fanny, Jane smiled innocently. <laughs> That's right, said Charlie. Now tell me, Jane, do you think Dick is Aunt Fanny's favorite? <laughs> I literally wept with laughter for the rest of the journey. God forgive me, it may be bad parenting, but it is also humor, and it would be wrong of me not to point out that Charlie is sitting in the front row here. <laughs> <laughs> um, the second bit I'm going to read is parenthood and I just warn you now that when I did the audio version we, this took about more takes than anything else so it was a, quite a lot of I'll be fine in a minute so um, bear with me um, the 48th of 50 things parenthood you know your children are growing up when they stop asking you where you came from, where they came from and refuse to tell you where they're going. P.J. O'Rourke. There is a thing floating around on Facebook that says, if you want to know what it's like to be a parent, take all your belongings, throw them on the floor, pick them up again, repeat for infinity. <laughs> and in truth, it's a bit like that. It's messy and unending, but as well as involving lots of tidying up, parenthood is the most amazing miracle going. For starters, one of the most amazing things about parenthood is that it's by far the most significant thing that most of us are lucky enough, who are lucky enough to be parents will ever do in our lives. I say most of us because pe some people achieve remarkable things that surpass even the miracle of parenthood and change everyone's lives. For example, Sir Tim Berners-Lee invented the internet. I'm proud of being your father, but I think the internet kind of trumps that in terms of impact on the wider world. <laughs> Although, who knows what you kids may achieve. Anyway, you get my point, which is that parenthood is the biggest thing most of us ever do. Yet here's another amazing thing. The beautiful paradox of parenthood is that, in my view, the moment in which we conceived you is a secret known only to God. At best, we can only guess, but never with any real accuracy, the moment we used our bodies to create another life. It is truly a miracle. When Charlie was a couple of weeks old, I remember a friend who'd been holding him, handing him back to me and saying, now you know how much your mum and dad loved you. And of course, among the many other amazing lessons parenthood teaches you, that is one of the first, because truly, and I can tell you this from experience, anyone who stayed up with you night after night, cradling you in their tired arms and singing softly to you as you cried, in spite of the fact that they were so exhausted from sleep deprivation that they went to sleep under their desk at work the next day, yes, really, those people love you unconditionally. Likewise, Anyone who soothed you at two o'clock in the morning as your first teeth painfully pushed their way into your mouth when all they could do was rub your gums and deny themselves yet more sleep, those people loved you. As did anyone who gently wiped you clean as they changed your filthy nappy for the thousandth time. And all of this without a word of thanks because you couldn't talk or even a smile. Trust me, those people love you. Which is just as well because that is only the start of parenthood. Once the little bastards start walking and talking, <laughs> that's when the trouble begins. To be a parent is to have parts of your soul walking around outside your body. You are a hostage to fortune. It is tiring and expensive and sometimes thankless, not to mention grindingly exhausting and often a bit scary. Plus there is the indignity of being covered in vomit, snot and saliva on a daily basis. But not one bit of that matters. It is a price we willingly pay for the privilege of loving you, of loving you and being your parent. The writer Peter de Vries said, the value of marriage is not that adults produce children, but that children produce adults. That is absolutely true. 
We do things for our children that we would, children that we would never do for ourselves or even our other loved ones. Children define you. When you become a parent, you have to work out where you stand, what your values are, because you're about to bring a life into the world and shape it for the first 18 years or so of its existence. Everything you do will be influential to a level you have never achieved before. Another miracle and also a warning. And all too soon, just as the teething and the potty training and the sleepless nights come to an end, so the letting go begins. But where does it begin, this letting go? Looking back, I think it's probably on the first day of school. My father, your Irish grandpa, once said to me, you never realize until it's too late that from the day your children are born, you are preparing them to leave. When you were little, I could pretend I didn't hear him correctly. But now, as you're all teenagers, I have to face that stark reality. Our job, the first phase of it anyway, is coming to an end. This is the bit I might go a bit wobbly. But oh my darlings, how we shall miss you. Every meal, every question, every journey to school, every Christmas, <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> every birthday, every holiday, every precious moment is a special treasure for which I cannot thank you enough. For as Peter de Vries says, you have made me who I am. My beautiful boy, Charlie, you embody wit and charm and you drive me crazy, not least because when you apply yourself to something, you make it look so easy. And my darling Amelia, so beautiful, so strong, so vulnerable, so funny, I am already praying for your future husband. <laughs> and Esme, my little star, the, bright li the brilliant listener who uses my own logic to defeat me in arguments and who has the kindest of hearts. You are all exceptional people and I am so proud to be your loving dad. If I am in any way a good or decent person, it is because I had the immense and overwhelming privilege to be your father. So, over to you. Well, I think I might need a moment to collect myself. <laughs> um, Sorry for swearing. I wanted. I think. I think we're all. I think we're all mostly grown-ups here, aren't we? Probably. That's probably okay. You can get away with it, I think. Um, I wanted to let you read from the book before you really talked about what mm. the book was, because I think that um, reading those, particularly those two passages juxtaposed, really gives you a, a sense of the flavour of what of what this book is, and um, the way in which it came about. I think um, was was very interesting, um, you know, to me um, as somebody who's kind of worked in in the the booksy world um, for quite a long time now. But it, it, you, you're not somebody who has spent your life writing. Um, you're not somebody who's published a book before. You've spent a long time working in the film industry. Mm. And then you reach 50, and you had, you say, there's a foreword um, in the book, as people who've read it will know, in which you explained that you had what felt to you to be a sort of midlife crisis, where you suddenly thought, you know, what am I doing here? What's, mm. what's the point of it all? Um, and your, the way in which you responded to that was to produce this book, which is... A, a, a series of letters, I suppose, to to your children. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk a bit about about that thought process and, sure. and you know the way in which it was triggered? Which so, was interesting too. Yeah, you know, you kind of fifties great, isn't it? You can have some champagne and your friends come to dinner and you pay. <laughs> and, um, and the the thing is that the it's not a great untelling of truths if I say that we'd been through a court case in my family. Um, which had been very contentious and had taken a very long time. And it wasn't something I brought and I couldn't avoid it, but I was hauled into it. Mm. And there is no question that it sucked up the bandwidth for quite a while, even though we, I didn't talk to the kids or, you know, we didn't talk about it as a family. We, um, you know, but it was there in the background. It was like this big, dark, rubbishy thing in another room and you couldn't get away from it. And I sort of, so you sort of have this conversation about, wow, I'm 50, I'm probably, over halfway and you know I've been working in the film business for 30 years and I've been trying to be a film producer for 10 of them and you know I, actually I've been writing all my adult life mm. and never been published so there was this sort of well there's all this stuff that didn't work what have I got to show to my kids and again part of it was about I wanted to redefine the narrative I didn't want the kids to think that the defining episode of my adult life was this stupid court case right I mean, it was, and again, it, for those of you who are familiar with Bleak House, it was John Dice and John Dice. It was just awful, and it's been going on a very long time. And I just didn't want them to think that all I was leaving behind was, a, you know, a load of lawyers' bills. Mm. So 
And then, of course, you start to think. So, so then I started, to, then I had a really funny conversation with a friend of mine who's now, in the film industry, we say, you know, there's that expression the Chinese say, if you stand by the banks of the river long enough, you'll watch the bodies of our enemies float yeah. past. <laughs> Well, we say something f similar in the film industry, but I've been quite lucky because I've made a lot of friends and they've all gone on to get really great jobs. And a couple of them are now running film studios. And one of them, um, we were talking, and um, that's significant only because obviously now I really do hope to become a film producer. Um, but the... Um, because there's no other way. Um, but this friend had just gone through an insane Hollywood-style divorce. And he said to me on the phone one day, I'm going to write a book for my boys called 500 Things I Wish I'd Known About Women Before I Started Dating. <laughs> and so I said, that's a great title, but I have to tell you, there are not 500 things. There are three things. I've forgotten two of them, and the important one is, it's all your fault. <laughs> and so we laughed and kept laughing, as 50-year-old men do. And then he said, well, this way, do you should write... Because I'd been talking about, I'm going to write a blog for my kids. I want to improve the narrative and he said well what you have to do is write something for your kids that um, is noble and uplifting and I just suddenly knew in that moment I was going to write the 50 things and I didn't know exactly what the list was mm. but I knew that that's what it was going to be yeah so. and so 50 years mm. 50 things mm. be honest mm. did you get to 47 and think I've really got to think of three more. No, actually, there were a lot right. that I didn't so do. Yeah, I, I cut out. Um, and in fact, when we came to... Because obviously, I blogged it to start with, and then there came this thing of making the blog into a book, and it is a bit different. Mm. Um, and the publishers, Trapeze, um, were fantastic because there were a couple of topics that they felt were very similar. So I think... I, I, Forgive me, I can't remember if I took out generosity or charity, but one of them came out because they were virtually identical. And, and then, I think literally 10 days before it went to print, I had to rewrite politics because of Brexit. I wondered about that. Oh, yeah, that literally, they rang up and just went, we're really sorry, but this yeah. needs to... Something's yeah, happened. Yeah. So, <laughs> did you see the news? Yeah. Um, Brexit, Theresa, all of that. So, um, anyway, that yeah. was... And so, as you said, it, it started life as a blog. Mm. Um, how did that process um, affect it? W were you getting comments underneath it? Were you getting feedback from the audience? Yeah, there, well, there, it wasn't a big audience by any means. Um, first of all, I went and spoke to the children and said, are you OK if I do this? Mm. Because ultimately, if it's from me to them, why not just write a postcard, right? I mean, but again, what you're doing is declaring your hand. What you're saying is, you know, this is my statement to you. Um, so... And the children were magnificent about it. I was really expecting a teenager at some point to put up their hand and go, you have to be kidding. <laughs> and that never happened. Um, so, the, and the blog wasn't widely seen. Um, I mean, I'm sure a lot of the people in the room who are friends would have been pestered into looking at it at some point or at least politely pretending they had it at a dinner party. Um, that's what I would have done. Um, so, the, the, but the comments were all nice. Mm. All the comments were great. Um, and then... Um, and the rest is hysteria. We just sort of stumbled into <laughs> yeah. to this. And having that, you know, you talked about the fact that it is, it's addressed to your children, as yeah. you know, you, it was clear from the readings that you did. You're, you're, it's in the second person, you, you know, you're thinking this and you're thinking that. Um, and, but at the same time, you knew from the start that you wanted it to have a wider readership. Mm. Writing for those two different audiences, what was the effect of that? How did you manage that? How did you manage to kind of grapple those two things? Because they are, there's the general and the specific, and you need to yeah, balance them. The, it's interesting. At the start, I, my inclination was not to have it just be me ranting on. Um, and so that's why the quotes are there. Mm. It's to let them think that someone they might have heard of who was smarter than me actually had an opinion about this too. So, yeah. you know. Um, but also, I suppose, to validate it for people who don't know me or my children or any care about any of that so so that was so I suppose a tip of the hat to them um, and beyond that I've got to be honest I didn't really think about it mm. because I didn't know what would happen I didn't know that it was going to be a book at that point yeah um, and, it, and again it was such an easy process because I was really lazy about it <laughs> what brought, do you well, mean? well because I mean I blogged it I mean I was 50 in July 2013 and I started writing it that month and I probably did one every 10 days or right. maybe that, two weeks. That's, that's kind of a lot. Yeah, but it's, I mean, they don't take long to write. I mean, it's... <laughs> <laughs> Trade secret, yeah. sorry. 
don't um, do that one. It was, but it was an easy organic thing. It didn't yeah. feel stressful at any point. And then at what point did you know that it was going to become a book? Well, and what were the changes that you had to make? Well, it's, 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 it's why it's lovely to be here today, because it's sort of because of, hey, um, a friend of ours um, who I know through, um, through work um, came to stay at the house because of Hay Festival. And, uh, and, and this person and I are on a panel together, so we're always talking about the work we do on the panel. And I'd never really taken on board that she was London's foremost book publicist. And she had never taken on board that I was, you know, working in the film industry and writing a blog. And so because of coming to Hay, she sort of read the blog and went, what are you going to do with it? And I mm. said, um, is it me? Am I, I moving? I think there's a little crackle. Oh, sorry, I'm using the, OK. There we go. Can is you all hear me now? Yeah. Perfect, sorry about that. Um, so she, um, she came to stay and read the blog and said, what are you going to do with it? And I said, well, I've blogged it, so that's mm. nice, isn't Thanks. it? It's well finished, done. yeah. And so she said, hold on a minute, and came back, um, metaphorically, 10 minutes later with a very nice lady called Claire Conville, who turns out to be one of London's top literary agents. And they sort of wafted me into these lovely meetings. And, and the thing about publishing, I'll tell you all, is that nobody's ever very far from a glass of wine. Mm. They just don't function. So it was lovely. We had lots and lots of lovely meetings with people who, one of them was even in a pub. Excellent. We were there, all, we were there till closing time. <laughs> and they give you piles of books to take away. And, and you sort of feel a bit sleazy because you know that you might not end up, you know, doing the deal with that person. So you had all this alcohol and all these free books. And anyway, we ended up with the lovely people at Trapeze. Um, and the, uh, so again, it was just, I went to some lovely hey. meetings and had coffee and drinks and, yeah. So I know it shouldn't be this easy. <laughs> yeah, so if there are any um, wannabe writers in the audience, they all hate you now. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but actually, it's interesting, you know, you saying the fact that it, that it felt very easy and very organic. And I think you said to me possibly before um, we came up on stage that it felt that it was meant to be. Um, and something that, that, a thread that runs through the book in a very kind of light touch way is your faith. Yeah. And I wondered... Yeah. Um, how much that had informed what you'd written and, and, and sort of, you know, particularly in, in terms of the topics that you chose and, and your take on them, whether that had been an integral part of the writing process for you? Yeah, I guess in the sense that I... Um, I, I sort of... I, I, I just really bug myself sometimes because I'm always really pollyanna -ish. I do generally think everything's going to work out fine. Um, and... And in fact, I recently had a couple of days where I didn't feel that way and was sort of reality checking myself all over the place, um, which wasn't so great. I actually mm. prefer being deluded and optimistic. Um, <laughs> so, um, but yes, in terms of the faith bit, the, well, I guess it's a demonstration of faith because it came out of, you know, having had this miserable experience with the court case and mm. feeling quite depressed about that. Um, and again, I'm, you know, my career for, the last 10 years at least has been, you know, fairly fits and starts because I'm a consultant and so I work when work comes and yeah. don't when it doesn't. So, um, and that can be frustrating. Um, and so the, the faith bit was just in keeping going. It'll be all right if, mm. you, if you just carry on. So the, but again, I didn't have a mission statement for this. I didn't have a plan at the outset. So anything that happened was lovely. Yeah. At every stage, it was all just, this is more loveliness rather than, oh, well, this isn't the plan. There wasn't a plan. Yeah. You know, I literally Forrest Gumped my way into this. <laughs> to um, use a film analogy. Yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned this court case a couple of times, um, which uh, was not something that I was aware of before, mm -hmm. before we began talking. But, but one thing that does become clear um, throughout the book is that your view of your own family, your parents... I think you used the word dysfunctional a couple of times, and there is a sense that it was not, um, you didn't yourself have a straightforward upbringing necessarily. Yeah. Um, and I wondered as I was reading it, um, to what extent this was an act of rebalancing for you? Yeah, I think so, because the, I mean, obviously being a parent gives you wisdom mm. in the sense that you've, you can forgive a lot, can't you? I mean, that line about, you know, now you know how much your mum and dad loved you, and that recognition that whatever they did, was probably the best they could do. Yeah. I don't think anybody sits down and says, well, how are we going to screw up the children? You know, They really are giving yeah. it their best shot. Even if it's crap, it's their best shot. So you have to forgive it. Um, 
Yeah, everybody's doing the best they can. So yes, so to a certain extent, it. Um, what is it they say? That lovely line about it's never too late to have a happy childhood. Yeah. You know, you get to rewrite that and mm. see it in a different prism, recast or through a it. different prism and recast it. Yeah. Yeah, but there was. Um, a sense in which, it, it, it was sort of leading on from that then, I guess, were you to an extent writing it for yourself as well, for well, you, I'm sure yourself that that's, as a kid? Yeah, definitely part of it, because the, I mean, yeah, I never thought, mm, maybe. That's maybe a bit too yeah, armchair yeah. psychologist. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yes. Well, I must have done, because it's quite a self-indulgent thing to do, isn't it? I mean, you know, drag my laptop into the corner of the drawing room for a year and, you know, occasionally type something and, mm. you know post it to the world. That's quite self-indulgent. Yeah, okay, I'll take that. <laughs> um, and in terms of the, the um, well, there's a couple of things that I wanted to ask you about the, the entries themselves. Um, the first of which was to do with the order in which they come, because you start with com compromise, mm. um, which is interesting. I was very interested by that because it's, it doesn't feel to me to be an obvious, you know, it's not a kind of, you're not starting with a big bang, it's not the big kind of film opening it's a compromise, you know, it, it's something that is by its nature, it's, um, it's low key and it's thoughtful um, and not sort of symbols and, you know, gunshots. And I wondered why, why you'd chosen that as, as the opening. I know exactly why I chose it. Um, and it wasn't meant to be, I was gonna do something else first. And literally as I sat down to write, I'd been talking to a friend who was being treated for cancer. And she, um, She's passed away now, but her sister-in-law is Emma Thompson. And I just, and it just, I just, my mind works like this. I jump from, you know, I do that association thing. And I remembered reading an interview with Emma Thompson around the time that Sense and Sensibility was released, um, where she talked about compromise being a word that means nothing if you're under 30. Hmm. And, and I just thought, actually, that's so great. I really know what she means. And so that was, that, and it was literally because I put the phone down from speaking to Claire and then went, compromised. Mm. And it was just, and I knew exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. So, and actually, that was the process all the way through. There wasn't um, a defined order until I probably got to, when I got to 35, I knew what, I knew what I wanted the last. You were, it was, to yeah, be. the final. And so I, and I wanted to, to sort of, if there was a sense of building it, I wanted to build to that. Um, I knew that love was going to be mm. the last one, um, which I didn't know at the front because I think in, when I, in grief, which is number three, I, that was yeah. going to be love. And then we got yes, this you say message. That, I think. And so, and then I just rethought the whole thing. Yeah. But um, so, so, but apart from that, it was very organic. I'd be driving the car and it would go, okay, I'm going to do this one next. Mm. And then I would sort of, um, you know, let it just percolate for a bit. Mm. And which were the really knotty ones to write? I mean, we, you mentioned politics and Brexit and that throwing everything up in the air slightly because that, that was, was fun, a, though. Yeah. That was <laughs> well, really then it becomes fun. kind of you yeah, know, gonzo journalism. <laughs> well, look, I mean, I kind of feel that sex was difficult to write because it, there's obviously so much, like, what's he going to say? And that's, <laughs> what did I say? Turn your phone off, you know. Um, <laughs> which I still think, by the way, is really good advice. Um, Actually, that was an, it was an interesting one, that, because I, when, I, when I got to that chapter, you know, you sit up a bit, sex, right? Okay, here we go. Um, and it was very clear, practical, non-negotiable advice about phones, <laughs> which wasn't again, necessarily you know, what I was expecting. Right, your, your son is too, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, they're teenagers, what are you going to do? Yeah. Um, so... So there was another one that was really thorny to write, and I think it was sacrifice. Right. Um, <clears throat> because you know, I was I was writing that in the middle of. You know, how do you, how do you, talk to your children about what is happening in the world in terms of what's just happened in Manchester or Westminster or mm. Berlin or Paris or Nice last year, um, and and yet still have a, a fulfilling and happy. Um, and free life. Yeah. And you have to understand, and, and again, I think sacrifice was thorny because I didn't, you know, it was obviously the, um, the centenary of the, the, you know, the First World War which inspired it and those amazing images from the moat at Tower Bridge. Um, but you want them to see democracy as something to be valued and cherished and understand that it didn't come without a, without mm. a prize. I mean, it is extraordinary that it is just a hundred years 
just 100 years since women got the vote. Yeah. And people died under racehorses to achieve that. So, you know, and again, I know it's boring, but I just don't think any of us should be complacent about, you know, the, the freedom to vote as mm. we wish. Um, Children. Um, <laughs> and the... So, so sacrifice because... There is sacrifice in everyday life. You know, 80, what was it, 22 people in Manchester sacrificed their lives, you know, enjoying life in a liberal democracy. Um, and I think it's really important that while we are obviously all anxious and afraid for our children, as we're going to be every day of their lives anyway, um, that we don't stop doing mm. what we would do. I mean, I was brought up, you know, my, my, I was seven in 1970, and I'm half Irish, and I well remember the IRA bombing campaign at, in the 70s. Um, but I also remember my mother, who was English, and my father, who was Irish, both saying, you must never compromise. You must never not do what you were going to do because then they've already won. Mm. Um, and I just think that that's, you, you know, we all have to find that bit of steel and carry on, don't we? And that brings us on to, well, there were two, two chapters that um, I thought were particularly interesting because I suppose that one of the potential pitfalls of writing a book like this is that it could end up being too cosy, um, too comfortable and too... Um, what's the word? I suppose sort of self self supporting or, or self endorsing. But actually, there are, there are several places at which in which um, the advice that you're giving and the thoughts that you're sharing are are not you know are, are complicated thoughts. I think you know I mean they're complicated subjects. So I suppose it's not really surprising in that sense. But I thought um, tolerance, um, w you know, would, was I, mean, I reread that about three times because it's such a kind of. It's such a complicated issue. It's really difficult. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, I'll waffle a bit and you'll pull <laughs> me up. But yeah, it's tricky, <laughs> isn't it? Because you... If I can't tolerate your intolerance, I'm as intolerant as I think you are. Mm. That's it. That's the nub of it, isn't it? I have to allow... I have to allow you to believe whatever you want to believe. I have to be fine with it. Now, I think that the, the line, obviously, is that if you think that it's okay to kill me because I disagree with you we may fall out. Probably. So that's a clear and reasonable line. But I think that, I think what's in, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, we're watching this frankly absurd election campaign descend to its finish <laughs> next Thursday. And the interesting thing is that both the major parties have tried to paint working class people as racist um, in order to win back the UKIP mm. vote. And I don't think we are racist. I don't think this is a racist country. Um, I think it's a very tolerant country, and that was actually drawn back to my attention um, when I was in France last year. Um, I was talking with a colleague who has lived in London for 10 years, although she's French, and she said, you know, my years in London were the happiest because it's such a tolerant and integrated society. Mm. And, you know, through positive discrimination, what you've enabled is an ethnic middle class, which has prevented, you know, the sort of divisions in society that we have in France. And she said, right. and, uh, her belief is that that's why we, they see so so many terrorist attacks in France. Right. Not that our security is necessarily way, way better than theirs. And that possibly is a contentious view and it's not meant to offend anybody. But it is, um, you know, this is a wonderful, tolerant country. Mm. It's, it's very liberal. Um, I think that's to be cherished. And if the price of that is that sometimes people offend us because, you know, they don't like what we believe and tell us or mm. vice versa, then I think that's, that's part of a vital society, isn't it? Yeah. And then the other one that I wanted to ask you about was courage. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> which again, I feel that you know all of these are, are they don't stand alone and, and no, in the no, they're they, all they flow of into whole, one another. Um, um, but in the, I think what was interesting for me, so a sort of very, very tiny bit of um, context is that I used to edit um, Mumsnet, the parenting website, um, and the the chapter about courage is about, you know, what it sort of is, it centers on what do we advise our children to do when they encounter bullying? And it was something that, you know, as you can imagine on a website like Mumsnet, it comes up a lot. And kind of the, the, the party line is, you know, if someone bullies you, you walk away. And that's not, that wasn't your line. Do you want to, can you yeah, tell us a bit well, about that? Yeah, well, it's a really difficult one, but I do stand by it because, um, and again, wherever you stand on Margaret Thatcher, you know, she divided a lot of people. But she, one thing she said that I thought was spot on was you must never appease a bully. And um, that bullying is about the psychology of fear. 
And I think if I had this conversation with all of my kids in the car on the way to school. They went to an absolutely wonderful school. Um, and the headmistress was, um, didn't really care about the parents at all. She wanted happy children. That's absolutely the kind of headmistress I want. Um, but we had this conversation in the car with each of them. And it went like this, having trouble with so-and-so, um, they you know, said they're going to hit me. And I said, well, OK, but if they hit you, just make sure you hit them straight back, harder than they hit you. And so then it goes, well, but then they might hit me again. I went, sure, he might hit you anyway, but at least he'll know you're going to stand up for yourself. But I suspect if you hit him back, he's not going to. And interestingly, in Charlie's year, there was a bit of trouble with a, a child who was obviously a bit unhappy and it divided the year into boys who would speak to him and boys who wouldn't. And, you know, the sheep and the goats were being mm. herded accordingly. And um, I said to Charlie, what happens? And he says, well, he threatens people. And then if they don't do what he wants, he hits them. So then mm. they do what he wants. And I said, well, that can't be everybody. He said, no, actually, Jeremy hit him back. That's <laughs> Jeremy's mum right there. Yeah. She's very <laughs> proud right now. And she should be. And, uh, and he doesn't bully Jeremy. And I said, but that's my point. Because what he's, it's not about whether or not you get hit that's already decided. Mm. It's about whether you show that you're afraid. Once he knows you're not afraid, he'll lose interest and walk away. And indeed, it was so. Mm. Now, that isn't easy. That really does take courage. And in my own life, as a child, certainly, I failed to have that conversation with myself and win it. I generally tried to appease the bully, but it never mm. made anything better. And the point is this. We all think that life is so different from school. It isn't. Take a look around. The same people that were trouble at school are trouble in life. They're just doing it at the pub instead of at school, right? And, you know, being bullied in the workplace, which I have experienced, um, is ridiculous. Yeah. But people put up with it because they're afraid. And it's, it is purely about the psychology of fear. So if you can put a stamp on it early on, it will be much, much easier in the long term. And I don't think... Well, look, maybe walking away works. Maybe the mum's net approach was the right one. But I just found for playground politics, mm. actually showing you weren't afraid. Because, again, I mean, th there was another issue where Charlie was um, having trouble with some older boys. And um, I said, oh, this is going to be great. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, just when the next time they try and intimidate you, just say, how much trouble do you want? <laughs> and he said, well, what, 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 how's that going to go? And I said, it's going to go like this. They're going to go, what? And you say, here's what's going to happen. Either you leave me alone, or I'm going to break your nose. <laughs> there will be blood all over your shirt. The entire year will see that a year six boy did that to you. And then we're going to get dragged into the headmaster's office, and he's going to be screaming at me until my dad comes in and says, are you telling me that a year eight boy was bullying my son and you didn't deal with it? Mm. And then you're going to be in trouble. So again, I repeat, how much trouble do you want? <laughs> And again, of course, the statement is so powerful, nothing ever needs to happen, because even the thickest year eight kid is going to go, I'm Not in trouble here. <laughs> right. So my point is, of course, it's all about posturing, but it's an important posture for a child to make. And it's about giving your children confidence, because, you know, we all look at school and go, oh, isn't it lovely? You know, they've got a lovely playground. This. And they look at it completely differently from their perspective of, oh, my God, these kids are terrifying. Yeah. And I just think it's... So, look, I didn't want my son to break anybody's nose, but I also didn't want him to live in fear of a kid who he thought might beat him up. Mm. Sorry, is that politically incorrect? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. I th it was really interesting to me and, and persuasive. And also, as it happens, I think that's the advice my husband gives to our kids. <laughs> um, and, I, and I have generally done the, well, now, now. Hmm. Um, and he says, no, 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 no. You've just got to, you know, um, be clear. Um, so, yes. <laughs> so, yes, that occasioned a discussion in our house as well. Yeah. Um, we, uh, we're... we're sort of at about 20 minutes now, so I have just a couple more questions um, that I wanted to ask, and then I'll open it up to everyone else. Um, I thought um, Desert Island Discs, you get nine records, and then you have to choose one. You've got 50 things, so the same ratio as you could choose five, I reckon. <laughs> if you had to choose the five pieces of advice of these 50 that you wanted to pass on to your kids. Okay, I'd go with kindness, humour... Uh, what else did I read? Oh, parenthood, no, I wouldn't do that. Uh, kindness, democracy, really important, that one. Um, career and love. Career? Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, as I say, I think at the beginning of career, I say there are two definitions for it, and one is, you know, 
your work life and what you do from the, you know, the moment you start work to the moment you stop. And the other one is to move in an uncontrolled fashion yeah. down a steep, river, steep slope. And as I said, I mean, most of my, most of, most of what I've done in terms of the first has definitely mm. been done in terms of the second. Um, it's been crazy paving with the lights out while hung over or drunk. <laughs> um, so um, I think that the, the, the thing I wish I'd known about my career, and actually this is true of my life, is that all the stuff you think is worth worrying about really isn't, and all the good stuff will find you. Um, but actually, if you can try as much as you, as, you, as you are able to do the thing that you love to do, then you'll mm. never work a day in your life. Mm. And I think that's a quote from someone smarter than me, um, but I think that's absolutely the truth. But is that, is that um, a, a sort of Western luxury that we have, this idea that you can have something that's, that we, that we have the possibility of doing something that we really love, and that's what a job can can be i suspect it is yeah it's, it's certainly a luxury ne not necessarily even a western one i think mm. that that is yeah um i mean it, you know any fruit farmers in the room will tell you there are not many yeah. british people getting up at four in the morning to pick their strawberries yeah um so but it is a luxury definitely mm. yeah. but one worth pursuing i'd say so if you can um i mean if you you know generally in life if you follow your heart you'll do quite well but mm. Um, but again, uh, just that thing of don't be frightened by the journey. I mean, my, my career is ridiculous. <laughs> I've been to Australia for the day and seen Antonio Banderas dancing in his underwear at 51,000 feet above the Pacific Ocean. My career has been ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound like a career. It sounds like a weird dream. Right. Well, there you go. Go to Australia <laughs> for the day. You'll have plenty of weird dreams. Yeah, I bet. Um, and this is what you did when you turned 50. Any plans for when you turn 60? Oh, I don't know. I rashly said I was going to write a comic murder mystery, um, Miss Marple, as written by Tom Sharp. Right. Um, set in a small English village, not unlike the one I live in. So um, that might happen. So we'll be back here in 10 years' time. Well, I hope it won't take 10 years. I'm slow, <laughs> but I hope not to be that slow. I want to, uh, want to crack on. OK. Thank you so much. Oh, um, thank you. I will... I think that there are people with microphones. So, oh, that's brilliant, thank you. So if you well, stick your them. hands in the air, and we'll get people to come and um, pass mics to you. So there's um, a lady in the middle here. Um, hi, Peter. Hello, darling, how are you? <laughs> Good, thank you. Um, I was wondering, so per chapter you have a quote, yeah. or, or a, um, a short phrase, did those initially come to you? So had you heard about them before or was it through research and both, reading other books? Both. They, either I knew them and liked them and felt they would have a place for all, or I did that thing of going through thesauruses and books of quotations and then obviously search engines on the internet. Um, and, and most of them were really easy to find good quotes that I already knew or liked. And there was a couple were from literature, a couple were from Plato and Socrates. And again, the, the, so the, the, the big discussion with the publishers was or everybody that you're quoting is a white middle-aged male. Mm. Um, even if they're, and, that, and so then obviously we go back and go, oh, all right, that, that's true. How am I going to make that relevant to my daughters? So we mixed it up a little bit. So I think Miley Cyrus is in there. <laughs> so. Yes. So like lots of parents, I um, frequently put articles and things on my kids' uh, Facebook pages for them to read, which they assiduously ignore. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> curious as to what extent you expect perhaps your own kids to read this out of duty, but other kids to read this and listen and learn. Mm. The, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I don't, um, I'm not allowed to see my kids' Facebook pages, so... Do you feel anything about that right now? Um, the, um, they were very sweet about it, as I said. And because I blogged it, they were getting it progressively over the year and a bit that it took me to do it. Um, and my daughters are at a boarding school. And my older daughter rang me up one night and said, I've just read the latest blog out in the dormitory. And four people are crying and are on the phone to their fathers saying, you've never written anything like this for me. <laughs> Which made parents' evening really fun. Um, but they weren't... Um, no, I didn't, I, didn't, I, I, I didn't have that expectation because I didn't know that I was writing something that was going to be a book. I knew the comments on the blog were lovely, but 
you know, what, what one of my most assiduous commenter, commenter was my goddaughter, who, you know, she's a sweetheart and she loves me. So all every she wasn't going to say anything if she couldn't say anything nice. So I guess I didn't have a real sense of of that, of how that would go. Um, and so just happy that people have been so kind about it. But again, I understand what I understand your point. I don't know that teenagers other than my own children are going to give a damn about this. Do you think it's a self-help book? Would you categorise well, it that Well, I certainly prefer that than pregnancy, which is where Waterstones keeps putting it. What? Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, can I just say that? It's really bugging me. Um, yes. Well, because I think, so the notes go, out, basically the book gets sent out with publishing notes from a company called Nielsen. And obviously what they do is they divide it up into all the, these are all the categories that might be appropriate. And obviously I suspect what they said was parenting. Yeah. And I suspect parenting and pregnancy are quite close together in Waterstones. Anyway, if you're looking for it in Waterstones, they're hiding it in the pregnancy section. <laughs> um, but I'd be, I'm fine with self-help. Yeah. I have no problem with that. Hmm. Yeah. I can imagine that... Um it's, it may not be that you've got a massive teenage audience because, mm. you, know, they've, you know, they're all yeah, busy doing other things. From me. But from the point of view, you know, I'm a parent and mm. my, my eldest um, stepdaughter is about to turn 13. Mm. And there's a lot of it in there that I thought this is, these are conversations that I would like to have with her. Um, so perhaps it's more that, you know, it's a self-help book for parents. I guess so. I, possibly. Again, I didn't start with the plan of I'm going to write a book for parents or I'm going to write a book for kids. Um, and in fact, the, the tagline that you referred to at the beginning mm. came quite late because you need, a, you need a tagline to tell people something about what the title is. they know nothing about. And nobody could think of one. And then um, this very lovely girl in the marketing department at Trapeze called Anna Bowen came up with... Um, lessons for when you feel lost, which actually sort of made sense because that was where I'd started was this thing of, you know, if ever I'm not here and you want to know what I would have thought about this, this, it might be in here. Mm. So that was, that was apposite. That was fine. But I guess that sort of did then label it in terms of it being a book about parenting. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Sorry. That was, I interrupted <laughs> the questions there. Um, who else has a question? If you stick, yes. Um, gentleman in the middle. Of course, I don't quite know how old your children are now, uh, but the fact is, um, the teenage years may be one stage, but you never stop being a parent. Can I'm getting a sense of that. Can you, uh, can you imagine the time, in fact, when maybe your children are sort of wiser than yourself and you are learning from them or they're getting messages to you? Sorry, say, what's the question again? Can you imagine a time when your children would, in fact, be wiser than yourself? No. <laughs> uh, well, I would say, sorry, that was a cheap laugh. Um, <laughs> I would say that the, that's already happened. I think that ship sailed a long time ago. I mean, they're, they're so much more literate in terms of um, the way we consume media, which is obviously a big part of a family where I work in the film industry and, you know, we're all, we all have phones and screens. And, um, but they're, I think they think I'm sort of fairly eccentric and naive. And there's this sort of rather sweet tendency to want to take care of me. I can see my son nodding out of the corner of my eye here. And, the, and certainly my daughters, they've got this insane logic that they literally tie me up in knots in arguments and defeat me. I, I think they, that ship sailed a long time ago. Yeah, they're, they're already there. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, over here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Better be a good question after all that. <laughs> no pressure. No. Uh, I hope it was worth the effort. Um, now that it's out there, um, yeah. Is there anything that you regret not putting in? No, I think we probably got whatever this is. I think we got it pretty much right. There weren't, I mean, there were, I was really lazy. I didn't write five things or 10 things that didn't get into it. It was, you know, every word I wrote is in there. So <laughs> um, it was economical. Um, but... No, I guess, if, again, it's, you know, you, you sort of try and choose things that are going to have, I mean, it was, they say, nothing dates faster than being current. But, so you want things that are going to be of the moment, but, but last as well. Um, 
I think that probably if I was going to do it again, I'd probably try and make it funnier. Um, I mean, there are some laughs in there, but you know, it's, I'd, I'd make it even funnier. That's the only thing. But again, I didn't have a plan when I started this, so I have no complaints about it. I mean, I do, I do really love the, um, maybe I should have read Dignity instead. Yeah. This is the one about trying to persuade my black Labrador, Sydney, who died just a few weeks ago, um, to release a pigeon down a phone. <laughs> so my wife was holding the phone to him, and I was going, Sydney, release, release. <laughs> But I was in London and he couldn't see me, so he wasn't buying it, this squawking thing. And then I... Um, see, my favourite... I, was, favorite actually, I was, was in the Groucher Club and I'd gone to my room to get my jacket. And as I left the room, all you could hear from the room, I'm sure, was someone going, release, release, let me go now, let it go, let it go. <laughs> and and I, literally, I swear to God, it, I opened the door and the chambermaid was standing there waiting to come into the room and I just smiled and put my jacket on. And, <laughs> and she was probably thinking there's some rent boy tied to the bed or something. <laughs> So uh, there we go. It's, a, it's a colourful life. I'd be sorry um, for us to leave the stage without you telling the Christmas pudding story, which was the moment in which I'll I the Christmas laughed. Pudding story. I love this. <laughs> it's a true story. If you've read the book, I apologise for making you hear it in my accent. If you have read, haven't read the book, I apologise for giving you a chapter you don't need to read. So um, I'm part of a fairly dysfunctional and crazy family. And at one point in his marital career, my father was... Um, uh, married to an Irish lady called Nuala Fitzsimons, who um, is, her family came from Kerry in the west of Ireland. And at Christmas dinner one year, her very religious mother um, failed to notice that the contents of her Christmas cracker had fallen into her Christmas pudding and it got covered over by um, brandy butter and cream. And she's a very refined lady. And eventually, by dint of her spoon, she realised that there was some, an alien object. And of course, it's Christmas pudding. It might be a sixpence. We're all used to that. So... Um, Anyway, she very gingerly got it on her spoon and she went, Jesus, Mary, and Holy St. George, I had a cock in my mouth and I nearly ate it. <laughs> now, what she could see that none of us could see was that the object was actually, if you had a charm bracelet made of plastic, it was a little charm in the shape of a farmyard cockerel. <laughs> so she went, Jesus, Mary, and Holy Saint, I had a cock in my mouth and I nearly ate it. And she's nudging people and going, I had a cock in my mouth and I nearly swallowed the whole thing. Look at the size of that. I could have... My God, tonight, I could have choked to death on the size of the cock I had in my mouth. <laughs> And she goes on about this cock in her mouth for a good few minutes. And we're literally crying with laughter. And, <laughs> and eventually one of my cousins, as we're all gasping for oxygen and reaching for the water, one of my cousins said, I tell you this, if she did have a cock in her mouth, it's the only one she ever nearly ate. <laughs> 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 so we said this was a family-friendly event. I think you know, just, it's appalling, isn't it? It's everywhere. You see, I didn't even make this stuff up. It all just happened. <laughs> No, I, I, I was reading that on the train and I was, um, got the proper giggles. And <laughs> oh, bless you. <laughs> so, yeah, I, didn't, I, I really felt that, if nothing else, by the end of this event, I had to make sure that you told That's that story. Right. In, my, in my best carry accent. Yeah. Yeah, there, yeah. <laughs> Which I appreciated very Thank much. Thank you. Um, any more questions? I'm sorry, I'm a little bit dazzled by the lights here. Yes, down at the front in the red T-shirt. Uh, thank you. Uh, more of a comment than a question, really. Um, I think it's the most beautiful thing to have done. Thank I, I, you. I lost my dad last year, and because uh, you remember him mm. at the age of, age of 90, but you remember him through sort of 10 or 20 years of decline. Mm. And I think it's the most wonderful thing to sort of leave for your kids this sort of evidence of you in your prime. I think we should all do it. I oh, think thank, you. Mm. thank you. Thank <laughs> you. One of the nice things about it was that um, as a parent, you know, talking to my children, um, I think I say it at one point, you know, the, my dad's got Alzheimer's now and my mother died uh, 20 years ago. And um, so my conversations with my parents were a little bit one-sided. And so it was nice to, I suspect I'm saying what they would say. Mm. I suspect that's where it's come from at some point. Um, even through the filter of the dysfunctionality. Mm. So, thank you. Mm. I think, um, was there somebody over here who... Yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we need the... <laughs> I'm trying to make a getaway. Come back. <laughs> thank you so much, and I've enjoyed everything you've said. Thank I'm just you. wondering how much, in a way, what, what you were doing was writing a partial account of your own memoirs. And I'm just wondering how much you would recommend all of us of a certain age to do something similar. 
for one's kids or one's grandchildren. Yeah, I guess why not? The, 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 that was the beauty of it. That it was um, what what the technology, what the the ability to blog and post it gave me was, if you like, um, a way to sort of get my feet wet. Um, there was no risk, was there? It wasn't. Um, it wasn't like you know typing it for two years and then sending it to a publisher and seeing if anybody would read it. Um, so there was a certain safety net aspect to that. Um, but the, but yeah, I guess it was a sort of a recapping of where we'd got to, where we'd come to, and how we got here. And um, yeah, I guess in that sense, it, w it was the beginning of a memoir. What, what, what the why anyone would want to read mine, um, you know, I'm saving that for the film book with all the film star stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but thank you. I think we've probably got time for a couple more questions. Um, if people want to, no, they want to go to the pub. Look, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's understandable. Yeah. Quite a warm day. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? No, no. We don't. Wave if um, I'm not seeing you. Okay, yes, just down at the front here. Oh, there we go. Sorry. It's becoming no, like an Olympic sport. He doesn't sport, want to do your it? event, love. Oh, he's I, not I, doing I, it. I, sorry, I, I've I, the lady behind you. Sorry. What? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> There's definitely time for both. Um, would you advocate your children to write about their experiences of you? I'd love them to do that. I, <laughs> I, think, I think they'd have to, probably to avoid legal battles, they'd probably have to change the names, but I'd love them to do that. Yeah. And the lady behind. Okay, so I'm going to ask you something. Hello. Um, hi. <laughs> you said that... Um, you know, your childhood, your parents did mm. the best job they could, mm. and it wasn't, but not a very good one, um, which I'm sure a lot of people can relate to. And do you think that a lot of what you wrote came from what you had missing? You know, that, that you kind of you knew what was missing as you grew up? No, I, think, I don't think what I wrote came from what was missing, because to be honest, you don't know that it's missing. That's the first thing I'd say. And secondly, they were, they're lovely, but they were fantastic, lovely people. They were just crazy. Um, but the, um, I think that when I grew up and sort of started looking around, you know, how do people bring up children, I realized that the handbook I had wasn't really fit for purpose. Mm. So to a certain extent, I think the, hand, the childhood that my wife and I tried to create for our children was based on an ideal we wanted for them, not necessarily anything I had had. Um, and certainly my wife's upbringing was closer to what we wanted for our own children. So I think it was in the doing rather than in the writing, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I guess I, I, sort of following up on that a bit, I, I wonder whether you, you don't know what's missing when you're a child, yeah. but you know what's missing, what you missed when you become a parent. You sort of, get, I think when you start to be a teenager, perhaps you start to realize that the lunatics might just have taken over the asylum. Um, yeah, there was, a, there was a certain amount of lip service going on mm. in my later teens. <laughs> so, or mid to later teens, I should say. <laughs> but they did their best. Charlie Dunn, you really need to go and get your car. <laughs> You're going to miss your train. Go, go. <laughs> so, still parenting, even in the middle of your event. <laughs> okay, I think, well, if you have to go and get your train, we should probably... <laughs> um, <laughs> wrap up now, I think. Oh, um, oh sorry, there's just... Go on, if it's a quick one. Um, and yeah, sorry, I'm going to make you run across to the middle again. Just here, the gentleman in the green jumper. There, there we go. Thanks, everyone. Hi there. Um, if you were producing a film of this book, yeah. who would you cast as the lead? Hugh Jackman, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen that man's abs? I was thinking Tom Hanks. Oh, that could work. But Hugh's got better abs. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that unexpected note, um, <laughs> Peter, I just want to thank you so oh, much. Thank you very um, much. It's for been a lovely. really thank lovely you. hour. Thank you. Thanks thank to the audience. Thank you. Thank you.